so now we're ready to start, finally, our fireside chat, which is interesting when it's 97 degrees and 60 percent humidity. But at any rate, so Tony Ressler, whom I have not yet met in person, uh, very impressive bio online. Uh, most of him, most of us uh, know him as the co-founder and executive chairman of Aries Management Corporation. And he led the group that acquired the Atlanta Hawks in 2015, where he now serves as principal owner and chair. I'm just kind of highlighting the local interest things here. In addition to numerous other leadership roles with other nonprofits, such as the LA County Museum of Art, Russell also serves as a senior advisor to the Hawks Foundation, a nonprofit which focuses on building bridges within our metro Atlanta community through basketball. Aries also has a local business footprint in our market with a local office and investments in Atlanta-based businesses. Joining him is Ernie Caballero, I hope I'm saying your name correctly, okay. is the Chief Investment Officer for UPS, where he serves as a fiduciary for over 50 billion in assets. While Ernie has previously rotated through CFO, Treasury, and other leadership positions at the company, both here and abroad, I thought it was very interesting to note that he received his MBA in finance from Kennesaw State University, which is our local, so excellent. And then he also completed executive leadership training at Emory and, and Harvard as well. So, <laughs> and with that, I will turn it over to you two gentlemen. The floor is yours. So. All right, Ernie, here we go. Here we go, Tony. All right, so we're going to talk about a few different topics, and these can just take a, a wide array of different ways in terms of which directions we go. So we're going to cover real quick a little bit about Tony, a very influential and very yeah, accomplished individual. We'll get a little, know him a little bit more. We're going to talk a little bit about markets. Uh, we're going to talk about also what he does on the philanthropy side and what he does for Atlanta more specifically. And probably what you're all here for is to listen to him talk about the Hawks. <laughs> so we'll save that one for the end. Um, so Tony, you know, tell us a little bit more about your interest in investments and you know, what kind of inspired you to really pursue a career in asset management or investments? Well, uh, I'm not sure I ever thought about uh, pursuing a career in asset management, I have to say. I actually went to Georgetown University School of Foreign Service because they had no math or science requirements. <laughs> so I'm not sure the path was exactly as expected uh, as I thought I was going to go into the Foreign Service and had an experience at the State Department. And I've always been enormously grateful to the US State Department as a result, because as a senior when I worked there, I was so amazingly disappointed that I thought, why not just go into the goddamn business sector? You know, whenever you worked at the State Department, in those, this was the early 80s, I might add, 1980, 81, 82, you know, and my focus was on the Cambodian desk, and there was literally a holocaust, and the, the lack of understanding at the State Department at that time, and then the disappointment in those days, where everyone said, I want to be an ambassador, but ambassadors are only successful or rich businessmen, which growing up, I never even knew what that was. And I'm like, well, I'd rather be one of those. And uh, so I've always been grateful to the State Department ever since. But um, so my path was a, a strange one. I worked uh, because I didn't want to go and stay in foreign service. I actually worked at, in the international department of a bank, which uh, for the older folks in this room, maybe you remember the manufacturers had a word trust company, uh, now part of JP Morgan. Um, I went through their uh, international group and training program. I went to business school at Columbia. Um, and then I came out and worked at a firm called Drexel Burn and Lumber, not around anymore. Uh, so there was a recurring theme, I guess. But uh, at Drexel Burn and Lumber, it really was one of the more uh, extraordinary periods, at least in my career. But from 1985 to 1990, I worked at what was at that time, again, for folks that are a little bit older in this room, I would say it was the most uh, extraordinary firm because it had absolutely the best people I have ever run into and, and a meaningful number of the worst. <laughs> and, and I will say if you're at a rather young and tender age, seeing the best and the worst hopefully gives you a sense of who you'd like to follow and emulate. So all, all I can say between seeing an extraordinary 
group of people and working with them. But also, and again, I'm dating myself, but in 1985 in the investment banking world, most firms, most investment banks, were not focused on companies that really needed capital. That might sound strange, but you know the whole idea of the high yield bond or junk bond market didn't really exist because most of the borrowers, most of the participants in the marketplace were high grade companies. And the smaller businesses, the less than high grade companies, really had to figure out different ways to find money. From rich people, maybe from insurance companies, maybe, from smaller banks, maybe, but there were no, the markets were not nearly as sophisticated as they are today. And if you think about uh, 1985 to 1990, we were financing companies that really needed it. And if you, at least to me, what made that so extraordinary is we thought we would be able to evaluate businesses that would and might not survive. And that, in my opinion at least, gives you an enormous ability to evaluate companies to do what is most important, determine whether they'll be bigger or smaller five or 10 years from now. And uh, what I even like, even, and today it's uh, moving fast forward, if you look at today's market, you know, it's a really interesting time. And you know, when interest rates are 1%, everyone is a great investor. <laughs> <laughs> and all I can say is I, I think we, we're going to find out who are, in fact, good investors in the next several months and years in this country. But I would say over the past five or seven years, if you had money, you were generally a good investor. Because 1% interest rate environments are very attractive environments <laughs> to buy things. Now, of course, what you have, is, we'll get into this at the market discussion, I'm sure, but you know, if you have 12 years of low interest rates, we shouldn't be so surprised that everything is so expensive. But Again, from the Drexel experience, I would say, for me, that was really my formative years, I thought gave me enormous background. And from that, I, I started one investment firm with five or six other folks called Apollo Management, still very successful and strong firm. And uh, while I was at Apollo, around seven years into my tenure, uh, from 1990 to 97, I was a full-time Apollo person. And from 1997 to 2001, we actually started a credit arm called Aries Management inside of Apollo that was a partner with Apollo. And over the, and, and some of my Aries and uh, colleagues here know this story or whatnot, but, uh, and again, under the category of not just turning this into a, a one hour Aries commercial, which is my nature. Uh, so Ernie's gonna smack me. No, it's all good. good. All good. <laughs> but uh, I would say from 1997 to 2001, we had great success running a credit shop at Aries within Apollo, but many of my Apollo partners appropriately were, hey, I'd like to have an Aries too, as it was growing. And really after four or five years, we had to make a choice about whether or not we folded Aries into Apollo, or, Apollo, or Aries, of course, would spin off entirely. And that, I guess, was the second most important. I would say my experience at Drexel, so I could understand the markets, as I thought, but really deciding, did I want to run a business where I really was, um, where I had partners, but no senior partners, or stay at a firm where I had partners, including senior partners. Um, and I made uh, what most everyone in this room would suggest to be the absolute worst financial decision in <laughs> January of 2002 based on paper value. I promise you, uh, the worst financial decision because I thought it would be better to be uh, a partner without senior partners than a partner with senior partners. And we separated entirely. Uh, many of my colleagues at Apollo thought that was a horrendous financial decision. Who knows? But I, I do think in January of 2002, we became an independent firm. For five years prior, we were partners with Apollo. So to this day, uh, well, I guess we're celebrating, as our Aries colleagues, we're celebrating our 25th anniversary at Aries Management this year, because really the first Aries fund was 1997, while we were still 
shall we say, partners with Apollo. We were the credit arm for those five years. And then in 2002, January of 2002, we separated. So depending on, with, with large investors, particularly our large institutional investors, we always use the 25-year title because we think it sounds more substantial. But you could probably use either one. Amazing. It's amazing. And from that credit shop, you really spawned into so many different areas, which we'll get to a little bit later. But what was your vision? So you had your founding vision. You started it. And you separated from Apollo, and you blossomed into a lot more. You know, what was the driving force behind everywhere else you went besides credit? Um, again, under the category of, of dating myself and appreciating the market 30 years ago versus today, uh, we actually did have a vision in 1995, 1997, certainly 2000. We thought a firm that had a really high quality credit shop that complemented a high quality PE shop, that complemented a high quality real estate shop, where each of the pools of capital complemented each other, helped each other with flow, with relationships, with institutional investor relationships, marketing, whatever the case may be. Now, again, if you look at the alternative asset management or even the asset management industry overall today, that seems painfully obvious. But I promise you, in 1995, um, the KKRs of the world, the Blackstones of the world, the Apollos of the world, the TPGs, all they cared about in those days, truly, was their private equity franchise. That's, that's the only place you could make real money in the eyes of uh, company buyers. And again, under the category of uh, maybe I came up in the distressed debt world and I worked on the trading floor at Drexel and I understood credit a little bit more, maybe than private equity, but uh, my view at least was the credit business could be easily as important and as exciting as private equity, as liquid credit, as real estate, for different reasons of course. And in those days that was a fairly unique perspective. Uh, I would say that our friends at Blackstone did it the best, the fastest, the biggest. But we were, at area, strangely enough, we were pretty close behind that. Awesome. If you think about that journey you've taken, you know, have there been any kind of key defining moments, any crucibles that you've kind of witnessed or experienced, you know, that kind of help galvanize your, your purpose of taking you where you are today and, and really kind of crystallize your view of where you want to go in the future? There's still more, I presume. Um, you know, again, I get asked this question a bit of, you know, when, where was the great epiphany? Uh, I'd like to say I had one. Um, but, you know, the, the decisions you make at a fork in the road, uh, for me at least, uh, were two. And, and one was when I was on the trading floor at Drexel, uh, when I was uh, asked to be a, a bond salesman at a three times salary increase versus stay in uh, capital markets earning literally 25 or 30 percent of what bond salesmen were making at that time. And I'm not criticizing bond salesmen or, or suggesting capital markets is a better profession. But for me at that moment in time, I wanted to understand and see every company I could get to. In capital markets, we touched every company, evaluated every company. And I thought it was a much more impressive and important job for me. And at that time, at least, my boss, who was Michael Milken, he, they just couldn't believe I would stay in that role rather than want to get paid. Who The highest paid folks at Drexel were the bond sales. And, and I just didn't think that was as interesting a job for me. So that decision, and then frankly the decision to roll out independently at Aries, also the weaker financial uh, option at the time. So uh, my argument was do what you have that uh, passion for that you think gives you more substance rather than, you know, it is, it's long term I, I would argue, hopefully it's not greed, but long-term objectives versus short-term objectives. Uh, I agree. I always say it's, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And that's kind of a good thing. Uh, I use that with my three sons a lot, and uh, I'm not sure it's worth it, but we'll see. I could use it on me. <laughs> um, given everything you've been through and have experienced, uh, when you look at the alternative and the private market space, how has it changed from then to now? And what do you see it going in the future? Do you see it being much different? You know, how, how for anybody in this room that really wants to 
take that path? What are the skill sets somebody would need? You know, how do you need to be adept and, and follow change, but also create change? Be a change agent. How do the markets change in these specific areas? And where do you see them along in the future? So uh, again, I always have a tendency to overly simplify the world, which uh, sometimes works and sometimes people get angry. But uh, I, I do believe that this liquid world is far more efficient generally than the illiquid world. So to me, what that would mean is over time, whether it's equities or high grade bonds, or whatever is, uh, has a QCIP, whatever is traded, that information is much more efficient. And over time, I would argue that the fee pressure and the ability to outperform, and I felt this literally for 30 years, maybe more, uh, that over time that would just grow and grow. And when you find great stock pickers, uh, great prognosticators of the direction of interest rates, uh, they, they deserve all, all the success and uh, uh, one could get, because it's, it's remarkably difficult to do that over an extended period of time. But the world of privates, and, and again, it's not just private credit, but it's private real estate, it's private equity. So there's a, this world of privates is so much larger than what most people appreciate, so much less efficient. And we felt that if, if there would be increasing pressure on those that manage liquid and public securities, there would be increasing, shall we say, interest and, uh, and focus on high quality private investors because they had, if you will, greater advantages to outperform, at least we thought. And generally speaking, if you look at what large pools of capital are trying to do around the world, the idea of privates taking up a larger percentage of the overall pie is continuing to grow. And as recently as today, as Carl Drake knows well, because I always seem to email him criticizing some research report that I might have read about Aries or the private <laughs> assets market. I'm like, why the hell did they say this? And then he explains to me why, and I understand. But um, as an example, today they said that the private debt, I believe was the, the direct lending market, they were saying was a trillion dollars in size. BDCs had 200 billion of it, round numbers. But when you appreciate really the addressable market, it's much larger than people realize. Because what was once considered a small, medium-sized loan was, again, 20 years ago, was 25 million to 250 million, or 150 million. Today, that's 25 million to two and a half billion. So the market is even, we don't even know the true size of the private marketplace. And the ability to self-originate product, whether it's real estate debt, or real estate equity, or corporate debt, or corporate equity, or ABS, consumer loan portfolio lending, if you will, or secondaries, or, or infrastructure lending, any of the products that we happen to perform or provide at Aries Management, Yes, I guess I am giving a commercial, but, but the truth is all of these products are self-originated that you can't create elsewhere. Now, you might say, well, I have other people that are originating product that are better than you. Okay, but there aren't that many ways to create high quality assets that really are tailored to what you're trying to do in your portfolio. So a long-winded answer of saying privates will continue to grow as a percentage of the overall pie and I continue to believe will, will be not, not just the outperforming asset class, but more importantly, the less efficient asset class. And again, today's world, it's hard uh, to make things uh, look positive when we're looking at what's happening on and in today's marketplace, but there are positives out there. It's just, uh, you gotta look more carefully. Yeah. So on that, you know, you have a huge global business where do you see the opportunities? I mean, there's tons of sector, geographies. Where do you think are the most attractive areas for institutional investors today? All right, so uh, I'm gonna make the argument that when markets go down, it hurts everyone, all right? We don't short stocks in Aries Management. So when markets, when interest rates go up, markets go down, uh, to suggest anyone should celebrate makes no sense, all right? But again, if you happen to live in a world 
where you at least appreciate markets going up and down, and that we had 12 years of low interest rates, as I mentioned earlier. You have to, particularly if you're hopefully overseeing uh, 350 billion of assets, you have to say that we have a world where virtually every asset we are buying or investing in is at very, very high prices. So what does that mean? One, we have not yet met an investor, and I'll defer to many of our market, we've not met an investor that gives Aries management investments or money, capital, to stay in cash. Nobody gives us capital to stay in cash. So what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to look at, particularly if you believe interest rates are very low and asset prices are very high, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to be predominantly floating rate, predominantly first lien or senior in a capital structure, and above all, if you're buying equity, whether corporate or real estate, focus on quality of asset rather than multiple. But truly, quality of asset, or even versus return. Because it's the quality of the asset that gets you through bumpy markets. So does that mean private equity returns could conceivably go from 20% to 12 or 14? Emphatically, yes. But if you're making 12, 14, 16, instead of the 22 or 24, we feel we've earned and can evidence we've earned over the last 20 years because we bought high quality assets, because we're forced to hold those assets seven years instead of four. Virtually every investor we have says, I get it. But if you buy shitty assets in an effort to make more return in a high priced environment, that's where your investors say, nice knowing you. And I do believe that distinction is where firms grow and where firms disappear. So if we look into the Aries crystal ball, and we get into markets, we're, we're, you know, like the Fed moved today, 75 basis points. I mean, we can talk all night about this, but inflation, what's created it? Where is it going in the future? How do you see rates playing a role in this or not? You know, and what do you see for overall economic conditions in the U.S. globally, recession, will it be a soft landing, you know, what, what, what in general, the feel of the market today and going into the future, what's your take on that? Well, again, under the uh, Aries crystal ball, I'd rather just give a, uh, my perspective on, uh, you know, the Aries crystal ball, I'd say, is still being formulated. Uh, I, I think we've had a view at Aries that prices were very high for an extended period of time, interest rates were too low, and we should have yellow lights blinking. And we've been saying this for three, four, five years. So uh, again, Aries commercial, but truthfully, we have less technology exposure, less private equity exposure, uh, less growth capital, uh, less non-cash flowing companies, I would say, than most of our competitors. Because we, we've been arguing this is where cash flow buyers and lenders. But uh, if you are a believer, which I am, uh, that Inflation is very real, and, and I know that there's politics involved and everything seems to be political. Uh, I happen to think that we had obvious inflation, we saw it, and uh, the war in the Ukraine, which exacerbated our current problems with inflation. Because when you have higher energy prices and food prices as a result of a war, it, it, it exacerbates inflation. So when people say, certain sides of the aisle. Uh, oh, it has nothing to do with the Ukraine. I disagree. And when people say, oh, no, we didn't have real inflation before the war in the Ukraine, I disagree. So uh, to me, yes, we, have a, a, we also have a series of issues that, again, we have a, a government and an administration, both the current and the previous, that when we saw the pandemic, we thought throwing trillions of dollars against it was the right thing to do. And I can't speak for everyone in this room, but I can speak for myself. I agreed that we should have meaningful government support for what I thought was an economy about to shut down. I can't speak for others in this room, but I was trying to move to cash. Uh, I was at a basketball game playing the New York Knicks, uh, March 11th of 2020. We were told to stop playing at halftime because the Knicks had played Salt Lake before. 
And we were like, stop playing based on this COVID thing. Well, what are you talking? So we thought it would be a week or two weeks. But then the next day, Adam Silver closed the season. We all were trying to figure out. But if you put yourself back in those shoes of March 11, 2020, I, I did think one, two, three trillion dollars in government spending to keep the lights open in most American businesses was fantastically obvious. What I think surprised everyone, myself included, is how remarkable the US economy adjusted to the pandemic, where businesses and individuals in not all, but many industries work remotely, sometimes more effectively than when we were in the office. Extraordinary. And again, I laugh only because at Aries Management, we had people working longer hours remotely than we had them in the office. And I'm like, Mike Arrigetti, our CEO, he kept worried about it. And I was like, this is great. <laughs> again, I'm like, but this is something that you have to, I don't think we saw this. I don't think Democrats or Republicans saw this. So the fact that we overspent was not because anyone was evil. And in today's political discussion and discourse, someone is always evil. I actually think we just mis misplayed the strength of the US economy. And, and that added to what is today uh, a very serious inflationary environment. Yeah, one could argue, if we didn't do that, where would we be today? You know, it could be so much worse. Nobody knows, right? So, you know, from a pandemic perspective, we talked about it a lot. We're starting to emerge from it globally, you know, fits and starts, you know, different regions of the world. But is there anything you feel we should have taken away from the pandemic, you know, either as a society or as a, or as an, you know, asset managers? And do you see a change moving forward that the pandemic has created, just open in any way, shape, or form? Well, when we talk markets and what could we learn from the pandemic, and uh, I must say, this is where I'm supposed to turn it over and say, Ernie, goddamn, you work at UPS. I mean, the world of <laughs> logistics. I mean, if you think of logistics, if you think of online retail, if you look at how that world has changed, I still don't believe we're feeling all of the ramifications. But one is, of course, the global supply chain. And how do we bring more important manufacturing back on soil, and that's happening. And that's happening, I think, almost more rapidly than many folks can appreciate. So yes, that, that, I don't know if that's a positive, but it's, I, I think it is actually, but it's happening very quickly. But the world of retail and what that means, and the world of remote work and what that means to office space and the cost and developing cost of offices and whether or not Andrew here today and our runs our US real estate business, but you know, retail everyone now, it's like I love industrial, I hate retail, I'm scared of off. That's a, a function of if you think about it, I would argue online retail has driven all of that yeah. to a large degree. So all, all, all I'm trying to argue is yes, we've learned many things from the pandemic. How to respond to a pandemic would be one. Yeah. I hope how not to make it overly political would be two. And I would say global supply chain and uh, core important, whatever defined, important manufacturing beyond on US oil. Yeah, and I would agree. You know, we think about when you say manufacturing is not the traditional widget, we're talking things like pharmaceuticals, the supply chain for that alone. You know, a lot of it sits in China. And so, what I, one of the takeaways I take from uh, the pandemic is you know, the national security interests of many countries. U.S. obviously leading the way there, but there's been a lot of things that have been globalized, that are outsourced, if you will. I think the new paradigm will be not to say globalization is dead, but it's going to be optimized a bit more locally, if you will, or regionally. You know, that will impact, obviously, supply chains. And when you look at the workforce in general, I think it is going to change. I think you know the pendulum always swings one way or the other. There will be an equilibrium that's reached at some point, but the new equilibrium, I believe, will be more of a hybrid approach. Right? So a lot of people, like you said, 100% remote, we're doing better. But 
you know, if you don't offer a hybrid today, we're, we're also having trouble hiring replacements in our business, even on the investments team. It's very difficult. But if you don't offer any type of hybrid solution, which is a key interview question that you have to answer correctly to try to land somebody into the job, um, you're, you're basically, you're a dinosaur, you're out. So I think it'll change from that perspective. I think you have to realize, you know, cultures of companies are also changing too. So the UPS, we deliver and we pick up. We touch hundreds of thousands of people along the way every day. And then you're creating a second class of worker, you know, that works in the office. They're better than everybody else. Right? And they're not as labor intensive. So, you know, what type of culture are you going to emerge from, let's say, in UPS or any other type of company, right? Now look at Elon at Tesla. You know, he's come out and said, hey, you can work remotely so long as you're in the office at least 40 hours a week. <laughs> That's all good. So I think you know there's a lot of things that are going to normalize, I think, to a more level of equilibrium, but it's a new new normal. I don't think we're going to be 100 percent remote. I don't think we're going to be 100 percent in the office. But that does have a play on, let's say, real estate as an example. Well, it has a play on real estate, it actually has a play on uh, the community we all live in. Because uh, again, we have many problems in this country, and I still think uh, the positives wildly outweigh the negatives. But one of the serious problems we have is the inequality of wealth. And that's going to be and has been exacerbated for a whole bunch of reasons. I would argue access to technology and access to low priced capital are two of the leading uh, reasons. But as time goes by, and we have office workers that can work virtually, but we have UPS delivery drivers or construction workers or other delivery drivers that have to work five days a week at their job on site, that separation will create and exacerbate some of the natural tensions. So uh, again, under the category of how do we make uh, the world a better place, what, what this is going to lead to, I hope, is that some of those folks that have to be on site should get paid more as a result of being in the office every day, and people that want the flexibility to work remotely, if it's five days a week or four days a week, they should take pay cuts. Maybe if it's one day a week in most companies, maybe not, but I, I, again, the environment is going to change, and the American worker is going to change in terms of their requirements. So, uh, time will tell. Yeah. When you think about, I talk about this a lot, the fourth industrial, or the, yeah, the fourth industrial revolution. So the advent of technology, robotics, social media, all these things that are being ushered in. We're in the infancy stages of it now. Everybody kind of lives in their own eco chamber, if you will. You get inundated with ads for things you like, the news you like, it just keeps coming at you. You get no other perspective. So when you think about the workplace, and I, you know, what I think about is the young emerging worker, you know, I benefited from this, and I'm sure you did as well. There's a lot of value in terms of collaborating, being around a workforce, coming up with solutions. You just don't even realize it. You realize it after the fact, but there's so much learning. Instead of just being a hired gun, working behind your virtual terminal and doing what, you know, the same thing every day. And your personal skills start to lack. There's just a lot of you lose touch with what I would argue you need to make a difference either in work or building a family or anything else in general. So I think there could be some lost generations if we continue to go down this road and say 100% remote, that's exactly where we need to be. I think we're losing something in translation in terms of building a career. It has and has not, you know, the tie back to what you said. You know, and also giving back to society, you know, is also, you know, I would argue helping people help themselves, getting them smart, helping them in their careers, all that kind of stuff. Right? So, I just think the more that we enter into this this eco chamber that we all live in, the more that we can be removed from what reality is. Maybe I'm just old school. I know you think, Tony, but you know, what, do you, what do you think? Well, again, under, as I get older, uh, I think the ability to compromise, I think, becomes more important. And in today's political discourse, uh, the word compromise uh, has uh, become a negative or, or dirty word, as they say. Uh, you know, I, I do believe that you're better off in the office for a meaningful period of time as a young worker in most any industry and the ability to collaborate. But I've also learned over the years, we've, we've lost it, Eric. We've lost some fantastic women at our firm that were moving into very senior roles because they wanted to stay at home and take care of kids. And uh, the idea of having those people stay at our firm and work remotely 
and whether or not we're allowed, uh, I'm not in the politically correct business, but are we allowed to have women with children work remotely more than men that don't take care of children? And, and you know, to me that's common sense, but if it, if it retains great women at our firm, I'm all for it. So uh, again, having really stern and fast and hard rules in remote work, uh, generally speaking, uh, I think uh, every industry has to come up with their own rules. And if Elon Musk wants to uh, play one way, it seems to be working for him right now. Uh, but there's a lot of ways, that, you know, if I've learned this, just as I like to say, there's a lot of ways of parenting, there's a lot of ways of running a business. So, yeah, uh, exactly. And don't, I don't want anybody to think I want everybody in the office 60 hours a week. So, you know, it's not I do. Uh, <laughs> but I'm not saying, but I'm not that relevant as, as the chairman rather than the CEO, so it's okay. I, I play the crazy uncle role now. In there. <laughs> so to me, hybrid and flexible work is kind of one and the same. So as long as you can make everything work, juggle everything, you know, add your values. Some days it could be in the office five days. Some days it could be some weeks could be none. You know, as long as the value is there, you're creating value, you're connecting with the team, you're helping to grow the team, and you're you're benefiting yourself and everybody else. Whatever works, right? It's just making sure that everybody is kind of on the same page. I think whatever works. Out. I really do think it, the employee of today is different from the employee of 30 years ago. Uh, they want their employers to be more active in the community more active in the social justice discussion, more active in the diversity discussion, uh, at least the majority of the employees in our firm as an example. So what we're seeing is companies that are supposed to be more active. Uh, that doesn't mean a focus shouldn't be uh, on being profitable and being successful and growing your business, but uh, the fairway has gotten wider in what I think the private sector uh, plays in today's America, which I think is a good thing. Yeah. And so to touch on another, I'm going to switch gears a little bit, you know, all the accomplishments that you've been able to kind of talk to, um, I think one of the more important, or some of the more important ones, are really your role in philanthropy and how you contribute back to the community, you know, specifically in Atlanta. Um, I'd like to give you the floor and just talk to everybody about what you do and how you do it and why you do it. That's a lot that you do for us. Uh, sure. Um, again, I, I don't really look at myself as, uh, active in philanthropy. I look at myself as I'm trying to use whatever we have access to to make the community we operate in better. Um, so uh, as an aside, in Atlanta, yeah, we, we are, and, and it's actually a for-profit activity, and I know this sounds crazy, but I couldn't give a shit if we make money in the Centennial Yards development. But we're building 8 million square feet in downtown Atlanta, and if you look at the last 50 years of Atlanta, um, Downtown has not gotten its fair share. And to put $5 billion in the ground to literally transform downtown Atlanta, I couldn't be more proud of that. Uh, to create a partnership with uh, the Russell Center, for those of you that have interacted with the Russell Center, uh, but to, to create a center for minority entrepreneurs and to help actually introduce BCG, a great consulting firm, who's helping to match small minority owned businesses with large corporations that want to increase their exposure to minority owned businesses and to help them get mentored and have access to capital. The Russell Center, the Atlanta Hawks, and myself, trying to build minority owned and run businesses in this country is a huge endeavor and as far as I'm concerned, hugely important for what has to be achieved in this country going forward. And uh, we could talk enormously about what has happened, but going forward, it, it's all about economic access and getting folks, particularly folks in the minority community, to be playing on the same playing field that I've been. And, and I do think the Russell Center is extraordinary for that. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, the financial literacy for all is, is basically saying, in today's world, strangely enough, sadly, and people of all color, 90% of high school kids in this country graduate high school, do not have to take it, do not know how to get a car loan, a business loan, a home loan. I think, you know, so uh, again, uh, my chemistry teacher, 11th grade, told me I would end up in jail. <laughs> so, I'm saying, but I didn't graduate with any financial acumen from high school. And I went to a large public high school in New York for what it's worth, but uh, today's world, we must transform education. Uh, financial literacy, and I know I don't mean to 
and I'm not going to use names specifically, but I, I had a sit down and I, I do obsess about financial literacy for everyone I do business with. And I, yeah, we, we had a player at the Atlanta Hawks uh, making, uh, I don't want to say exactly because you figure, but between 10 and 20 million dollars had no understanding of how to invest that money. And most kids, 22 years old, do not. It just so happens NBA players could be making $20 million a year, and I, at 22 years old, uh, was making $20 a day, making $5 an hour, working part-time. So I, all I'm saying is the point of financial literacy, whether you're making $18 million a year or $18,000 a year, is of critical importance. And uh, I would say that the ability to introduce financial literacy is actually not that difficult. Uh, this program is actually trying to create a website that has different level, levels of certification using SalCon, for anyone that has been or knows who SalCon and the Khan Academy, but basically coming up with basic financial attributes. And at each level, you can go online, we're not there yet, but we're gonna get there, where you can basically get certified so you have a certain amount of financial literacy, at least the foundation. So that as an example. Uh, we're doing something at Aries, frankly, that we're enormously proud of, something called Alt Finance Corp. And what we've had is, uh, in the alternative asset management industry, we've had a tough time finding, training, mentoring, keeping young men and women of color because they haven't had mentors that look like them that were able to leverage and help them the way I did. I had a brother-in-law in the business. I had a brother in the business. So when you have a brother, mother, uncle, sister in a business, any business, that generally helps you move along. So what, we're, what we did is, with four historical black colleges, we, are, we, we created a, a curriculum with the University of Pennsylvania, and then we hire, train, mentor, and position for success young people of color. And that, we think, with a 10-year commitment, and we think that over 10 years, meaningfully diversifies our industry. And when you get into the diversity discussion, the idea of saying every company and every industry has to know that this is an enormously important role of the private sector. And we don't expect companies to do things and change the world overnight. But I would argue that there's every company should have a 10-year plan to become more diverse. And that doesn't uh, change the world overnight, but it makes the private sector far more effective over time. So those are the things we've been doing. And again, under the category of you, you, right or wrong, but if you own a basketball team in any city, and I would argue certainly in the city of Atlanta, you're a community asset. So we're partners with the community. And yes, we use, uh, with the Russell Center, Every uh, business, if you come to games for what it's worth, and we do want everyone coming to games if possible, but uh, we, we, we advertise minority-owned businesses that have had success on our jumbo truck. Why not? It's great. It helps the community. helps the business. So we do that. All oh, I'm saying, those are things we could do. Um, and, and so far, it's, of course, if you're saying that versus making the Eastern Conference Finals, no, no, I, I don't want to. Uh, the argument is hopefully we can do both. <laughs> I'm sure you can. Speaking of the Hawks, let's uh, let's switch gears a little bit. But I'm going to probably start off a little bit more boring. Is there anything you've learned in your career that you've been able to pass on in terms of managing the Hawks, and you know? Is there anything from the business perspective that you've been able to kind of integrate into the team, or, and or, is there anything that you've learned from managing this team that's helped you in the business? Um, so, uh, again, it's, uh, the NBA is a very different type of business because, strangely enough, in, uh, you keep score very differently than most companies we invest in at Aries, I assure you. In, you know, in, in, the, in the private sector, it's about revenues and cash flow. Maybe it's about stock price, but generally it's about revenues, cash flow, growing the value of the business. In the Hawks, uh, it, it's about winning. Um, and uh, now, it's also about running a good business. But in the NBA, to win a championship, to be great, and let's, uh, 
uh, state the obvious for a moment. Uh, I've owned the team now, this is my seventh year, but the team's been in Atlanta over 50 years, never won a championship. And if you don't win a championship, not that I'm obsessed about it, but, <laughs> but if you don't win a championship, you cannot be a great franchise. It's a weird dynamic. It's hard to use that analogy in the private sector. But I, I'm not trying to bullshit yourself or, or you guys or me. You know, I mean, you cannot be a great franchise if you don't win a championship. And every great franchise in the NBA today has won at least one. And if you think about it, uh, nobody thought of Dallas as a great franchise. Or, uh, but you win one, one championship, you're now in the top tier of franchise. And right now, we are not in that category. And that drives me. Great. <laughs> I would use curse words, but I'm trying to be. I use a lot of curse words, but I got especially when it comes to it. So, all I'm saying is, so that's part of what we're trying to do. Uh, but if you're saying, have I learned running a good business? Yeah, but are there things? Yeah, we have many people at Aries. No one here, of course. Many people at Aries. Many people on the Atlanta Hawks that think they're underpaid. And for most human beings. They're remarkably well paid. There's a that there's uh, an analogy there. Extraordinary people, which is not criticism. Some extraordinary people think they can never be fairly paid. <laughs> that, it, it's what makes many basketball players. Don't forget, these kids are they're 450 of the best players in the world. Now, I don't know if any of us think we're amongst the 450 best. Wall Street investment professionals, whatnot. I don't know. Uh, hard to, but in the NBA, it's pretty clear. You're one of the 450 best in the world. And whenever I sit down, and I do, I'm, uh, we talk business. Uh, I don't tell players how to, how to help with their mid range or their crossover. Uh, I still play on Sundays, and if you saw me, you'd understand why I don't give advice. But, but I, I do love basketball, but I talk money and I talk business. And I try to explain to every person I've ever talked to at Aries and every person I talk to at the Hawks, yeah, this is a business. And, and you're supposed to make as much money as you can make, but you're also building a career. And you have to think of both. Uh, we don't, at, at Aries or at the Hawks, and I say this, and sometimes as, uh, and I will say what I love about NBA players, at 22 years old or 20, when you're talking money with them, they don't pay attention. At 25, they start to listen. <laughs> At 30 years old, they grab your leg. They don't, care. they don't want to talk about basketball. They just want to talk money. So if, as they mature, as they see that their career won't last forever. So my point is that some of these players have to understand that, yeah, you may not get paid what you think is fair, but it's not just your decision of fairness. All right, there are circumstances. But are you building a career? And I always say, that, which is, you have to take a 10, 12, 14 year view. And are you doing what's best for your 12 year accumulated earnings? And you know, I often try to say, living in Atlanta is a lot more attractive than LA or New York. Look at the house you could buy here versus, and they're like, just pay me the same, and then we'll decide. <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is. That's no, that's very enlightening. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, what I'd like to do now is open it up to questions. You know, we're actually we're running a little bit short on time, but you know, since we're ending with the Hawks, sure, we have and that's plenty of cash for everybody. You know, what kind of questions do you have for us? You got to have something. Got to be one. Please, please. Sure. So uh, I'm going to do the second one first, and then I'll because I think the bank discussion is a longer one. But in terms of uh, whether people work from home and whether New York becomes, and London for that matter, become less relevant, uh, I, I joke around. I, I really don't, uh, if people want to work remotely, I actually just think young people, particularly early in their career, benefit from human interaction. Older folks, more experienced people, uh, I actually think are the ones that, that don't benefit as much. So I, I just think it's better for the career, at least in our industry. So that's why I actually push young people to, to work in, a, in an office environment. Uh, but the truth is, uh, we, we happen to be doing beautifully with this increasing hybrid. And as far as I'm concerned, as long as we're doing well, why would you really complain about it? The world is changing. And whether it's uh, three or four or five days in the office, it's certainly not five. So uh, I, I actually think it's more important for young people than others. 
but the, uh, this is the first question, and, and you know, will banks come back into our market? Are they regulated out of our market? Is that the great benefit to uh, firms like ours? Uh, I must say, I, I actually don't look at it that way at all. I, I think banks uh, play an incredible role uh, in the world's financial system. Uh, their customers are governments, are large corporations, and are individuals. But they also lend to alternative asset managers like Aries as a lender to our large funds so that we could provide a turn of leverage on large funds, as an example. And they don't have the people to actually make the loan. But, uh, so, so I, I do want to make clear that there's a role for both alternative asset managers and large money center banks. But the other point that, that I think is lost in this discussion, so we make loans to companies generally, whether it's real estate lending or ABS lending or, but, or corporate lending, but we're basically saying we're going to lend to three, four, five, six times cash flow, 50, 60, 70 percent of the asset value. We're obviously doing work but on the underlying asset or company. But please understand, we're unlevered pools of capital making these loans. We certainly don't take anyone's deposits. Large banks are something in the neighborhood of 15, 17, 18 times leverage with deposits with government insurance. Who's better off making relatively aggressive loans for their own account. A firm like Aries, with institutional capital and no leverage, or JP Morgan with 17 times leverage, individual deposits, and government insurance. So what JP Morgan is forced to do, and I do believe regulations are simply saying, if you want to be 15 times 17 times, 20 times levered, then your balance sheet to get government insurance, to get government support, to have access to the bank holding company and to the bank window, to have all of the government support you have, you have to run a very different balance sheet and make and have a very different pool of assets on your balance sheet. In 2008, much of what we did in ABS lending was on the balance sheet of big banks with 15 and 17 times leverage. I mean, that was it. actually 35 and 40 times leverage, <laughs> 2008. Now, banks have delevered for sure, and banks are healthy. But the question is, what should they be doing, and what should institutional capital be doing outside the bank holding company? I think each pool of capital has a different role and far less leverage to pursue one versus the other. We are, uh, I'm going to defer, I, I think we are actually growing in Atlanta, and, and I think that's, that's a pretty good thing. Uh, listen, Atlanta, uh, Atlanta is a booming market, guys, so uh, the simple answer is yes. Uh, we do a bunch of things out of our Atlanta office. Uh, I'd say real estate and direct lending are our two biggest activities. We also run our investor relations activities out of there. So, uh, so yeah, we do a whole bunch of things out of our Atlanta office, uh, but we have pretty sizable offices in other markets. But I, I think what you're going to see, and I know this wasn't necessarily the question, you're going to see more people at Aries and firms like Aries because of the ability to work remotely, moving to lower priced, attractive urban environments. So. If you could make the same money, wouldn't you work and live in Atlanta versus New York or San Francisco? And that's going to happen in many companies. You're already seeing it happen. And all I'm saying is I think a lot of companies have to adjust to that. So, I'm sorry, back. Tony, speaking of attractive urban environments, as a Canadian hockey player, may I personally beg you to bring an NHL seat? <laughs> I'll tell you this, uh, <laughs> for anybody that's been watching playoff, ho playoff hockey is great. Uh, um, this city, uh, it seems like we've had two, uh, two at-bats, if I understand it correctly. And uh, for those of you that follow the team in Calgary or in Winnipeg, they're incredibly successful. <laughs> um, it seems 
that Atlanta has a, a, a couple of great years and then, and maybe it is ownership and maybe it is uh, the way those teams were funded and run. And I actually believe to a large degree it was. I, I think hockey could work here, so I hope that's clear. And the economics of having a hockey franchise in a building that's already built, I promise you is attractive. Um, but you know, in a weird way, I actually am a big believer, this is not as popular these days, but if you're gonna own a team, a sports franchise, if you're fortunate enough to be in that position, you should really understand, and hopefully a play, but certainly understand the sport, so that you have a passion, and I do believe people in the community know whether you have a passion, or frankly, you're just money. And, uh, you know, I love playoff hockey, but I don't, I never played hockey, I, I don't, I just, I don't know hockey as well as I wish I did it. And uh, so I'm not so sure I'm the right owner. Uh, but uh, listen, I, I actually do think hockey at some point is going to come back to Atlanta, by the way. Um, I don't know if it comes to State Farm Arena, but when you see what, frankly, it's doing in Nashville, um, it makes no sense that we don't have a hockey team. But, you know, we, we have five or six really successful professional sports teams right now, so it's, uh, sports market here is pretty good. As long as you show the respect and appreciate that the University of Georgia football team is first, we all, <laughs> we all can fight for second, third, and fourth. As long as you don't go there, uh, then you're okay. All right, any other questions? Just real quick, could each of you talk about- I'm gonna give you the microphone okay. so everybody can hear. Yeah. Could, you, could each of you talk about the mistake you made in your career <clears throat> and how you learned from that mistake? I say this only because we have a bunch of colleagues. I've made so many. Uh, it, it's hard, uh, honestly, it's, it's hard to, I, I'm gonna say uh, the mistakes I feel that have been the most significant always were tied to letting people that you knew were not up to a task stay in the role too long. Almost always. And I don't know if that's a mistake that's correctable because I, I, I just always feel, you know, you gotta give a person more, more time. More, and every time, once you know, and then you still just hoping for a turn, it never happens, uh, you know, after a certain period of time, you know. So it's always been, because uh, I, I have a really tough time uh, firing people, <laughs> always have. And, uh, you know, so the, the positives is, you know, you give people more room, more time, more rope to do whatever they have to do. But it's just, uh, it's always been the mistake I've made. Yeah, for me, this, what I'm gonna say is partly influencing why I believe this hybrid approach to work that we talked about earlier is important, especially younger in your career. You know, being in relation to the workforce I thought I could do everything. I was the smartest kid in the room. I could do all these things. I could work anybody to death, you know? And I, and I did all that. But there's this adage that we have is you can go faster alone, but you can go further together. So a lot of the mistakes that I've made in my career have been really revolving around the fact of not working well with a team, right? So, it, and it's very hard to do that, work with a team, but then also leading a team is even harder, right? There's so many different personalities. Everybody wants the same thing, but you have to approach it differently. And it's just, if you lose that, the ability to do something like that, or learn how to do it, like in my case, I never lost it, I had to learn it, and I'm still learning, by the way. Um, you just find that your, your kind of career can self-employed, right? Because you, you can't do everything, you can't be everything, you can't lead people, you're not gonna get, to be able to build trust behind your vision, what you wanna do, you're never gonna be in a position to manage others, you know, things like that. So. To me, that's one of the bigger things. Learn how to work with others, you know, and have them, you know, at the end of the day, they'll pay you back in space and you'll never realize it until after the fact, right? You just never know, but they can contribute a lot more than one person can. Different perspectives, different thoughts of diversity, all of these perspectives that we talked about. So to me, those are the learnings, you know, from mistakes. I'm also a big person that believes that uh, making mistakes is probably the best way to learn. And you gotta live them so you understand not to touch that hot stove. When I was a baby, I thought that I actually put my finger in an electric outlet and I never did that again. You know, but if I didn't do it, I wouldn't know what the other side would look like. So that's what I would say. Yeah. 
I was just real quick. The one thing I, I you, you didn't ask what decisions we did make that helped us. <laughs> All right, but just twist real quick. It, you know, when we first started Aries, we might have been 30 people. We had two billion of assets, three billion of assets for what it's worth of credit, and uh, we we actually said you don't get fired if you make a bad investment. You, you get fired if you can't work with people around you. We had one rule when we started the firm, which was no assholes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying. That literally was the best decision we ever made. I agree. Any other questions? Yeah, this is really off the wall. This is really kind of off the wall, but um, it seems to me that, that we've got so much inequity in the, in the public school system and how um, there, there's a lot of discussion about how al capital should be allocated to this school versus that school, and the real and it's all driven by real estate values, right? And so now we've got these exploding real estate values, and some people are going to benefit, and some people aren't. Uh, if you had an opportunity to to say, okay, stop, let's fund public schools in this manner, how would you do it? Right. As good a softball as I've ever been pitched. <laughs> <laughs> Only because. Uh, You're welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, I don't mean that. I actually built 27 schools in Los Angeles. Uh, so I built 27 charter schools called the Alliance for College Ready Public Schools. And uh, I still believe the single biggest issue uh, in this country is K 12 education. And it's fixable. And yes, we build schools just so you know for $2 million, uh, two million of equity, $10 million. 500 seats, round numbers, LA Unified, build schools, not, again, think about this, per student, we have 500 students in $10 million uh, buildings, that they have $100 million buildings for 700 students. All right, so uh, we're spending, and they exclude real estate costs, but we're spending 11,000 per kid to, to send them through school. We do only middle schools and high schools, by the way. 27, as I said. We have 13,000 kids. We graduate 100% of our kids, 98% go to college. So if we're outperforming and we're spending 60% of what the public schools are doing, and we're spending literally 25% per seat, we thought we were building a research laboratory for public schools. Instead, it became a political uh, discourse on union versus non-union in the classroom. And I, I'm actually not pro or anti-union. I'm just saying, let's create new research laboratories for public schools. And we did. And we did so successfully that the public school union decided you need to be unionized rather than be successful. Strange dynamic. So the simple answer is, you, you could do very different buildings and especially with the world of remote. It's not just remote and virtual. It's not just for uh, office workers. We have to change the way we educate. And, and there are laboratories out there. Uh, it's why I've been a charter school supporter my whole life. And I, I, I actually believe uh, this is enormously important. And the idea of changing public schools without creating research laboratories for success. Some will succeed. Some will fail. But that's what charter schools are supposed to be. And ultimately, we should have no charter schools in public schools. Charter schools are public schools in most states. They get funded with public money. Maybe they get supplemented by private money. But why not just have good schools? Amen. And it's out there. All right, if there are any other questions, we're going to put Ernie. Ernie. Oh, sorry. Didn't see us, sorry. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Shane Brooks, a senior software engineering major from New London, Connecticut, and I attend Morris College. Um, I'm just curious, what does your partnership with HBCUs look like um, with your company? So uh, it's called Alt Finance Corp. I'm kind of disappointed you haven't heard about it if you're at Morris. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, what the, so uh, and at Alt Finance Corp, we're recruiting kids, students, young men and women. Um, and we're recruiting them now to basically uh, go through a curriculum of what an alternative asset management firm functions, how it functions, 
what your expectations are, and how we help you hit the ground running. So right now we're at uh, Morehouse, Spellman, Clark, Howard. We're about to add a few more schools, by the way. But so we're recruiting and training students as we speak. So um, we could actually uh, introduce you. That should not be too difficult, but it should be on campus and completely available, as they say. Okay. I'm in tech, so probably that you said something. But, we um, like tech. Yes, and I got one more. So if you could go back, what would you tell your old, uh, well, your young 21-year-old self? What piece of advice would that be? Oh, I had so many bad habits at 21. <laughs> it's a long list. Uh, but, you know, listen, um, I, I actually only went through, and maybe it was, you know, it's like a cliche or whatever, but my father did tell me, uh, I've used one story my whole life about working, and I always thought that if you don't quit, uh, if you don't, uh, if you don't quit, you can't fail. And it's the only adage I've used, the only uh, theme I've used. And since I'm 21, it's been the same. I mean, I know this sounds crazy, but in 2002, actually 2001, I'm sorry, we started uh, our first private equity fund. You know, we thought I was coming from Apollo. Uh, we had a couple of billion in credit. We were doing our first PE fund at Aries. And I thought it would be the easiest fundraise and 9-11 uh, happened, you know, it, all sorts of things, and I could give you many excuses, but we marketed that fund. I don't uh, talk about, I certainly didn't talk about it then. <laughs> we must have been in the market for three years on that first one. And we've got 850 funds since that time. But, you know, when, if you're in the market for a PE fund for three years, I mean, most of your friends would say, you should stop. <laughs> uh, but we, we just didn't understand how people didn't see what we saw. So uh, I, I think I would have uh, said that to my 21-year-old self, and I've repeated it ever since. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks, Tony. It's been an absolute pleasure and an honor to have you here and to talk to all of us. We're going to wrap this up with a slide that has three facts about Tony. And I think some of you guys have already voted on this. What do we got? <laughs> Wow, impressive. <laughs> but I have to say, it is number two, the entrepreneurial oh. business at high school. Shut down. I was delivering camp trucks to sleepaway camps for little brats in the neighborhood. <laughs> and it was pretty successful. And that was my second summer. And I got a call from the Teamsters, and they said, you're now officially closed. <laughs> and I didn't even know what the Teamsters were. <laughs> but I did ask my father. He agreed with that. <laughs> if they say you're closed, then you're closed. <laughs> I play defensive end. I never play tight end. But all's good. And I never auditioned for a movie. No, that would be bad. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. For, appreciate it.